Assalamu alaikum. I'm your host, Agha Heather Raza. Today we have a very interesting conversation to take place. Pakistan and Australia have a very vibrant and dynamic relationship. This relationship is based primarily on the agricultural sector of both Pakistan and Australia. And to have our conversation today, we are, have the privilege to have with us today Her Excellency Ms. Margaret Thompson, Her Excellency Ms. Naila Johan, and Associate Professor at the University of Queensland, Professor John Steen. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Um, today we're here to discuss uh, an issue that's related to uh, Pakistan and a country with which we uh, do a lot of trade and have a very strong bilateral relationship with, especially in the uh, agricultural sector. Um, as we know, Pakistan is a very agro-based economy. And uh, to further understand the kind of relationship that Pakistan has with this country, um, I'd, we have a fantastic panel here today. Uh, and the country that we share one of a very strong agricultural relationship with is with Australia. And we're lucky to have uh, Her Excellency uh, Ms. Uh, Margaret Adamson, uh, Assistant Professor John Steen from the University of Queensland. And we are also very lucky to have Pakistan's High Commissioner to Australia, Ms. Naila John. Thank you very much uh, for being on our program today and uh, for giving us an opportunity to understand the very strong and vibrant dynamic relationship that uh, Pakistan shares with Australia, uh, especially when it comes to the agricultural sector. Uh, Professor John, I understand that you've just recently conducted a uh, research work uh, that uh, in regards to Pakistan's agriculture um, sector, but more importantly, in regards to the uh, credit availability and for women entrepreneurs. So, could, so to carry you on the conversation, could you please share with us uh, the findings of your research, please? Yeah, sure. So this is work that's been going on now for three years um, and we've collaborated with many people in Pakistan as well. So it's a, it's a team effort. What we really want to understand is uh, what are the main factors that can help uh, Pakistani farmers, particularly the smaller farmers, to um, grow their business, to create wealth in their communities and essentially to, to make um, the, 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 the economy of Pakistan grow and, and be more sustainable. And when we looked at um, our first survey that was done uh, nearly, nearly two years ago now, um, it was quite apparent that access to credit and access to finance was a, a major factor um, that was uh, helping some farmers, but, some, but the farmers who couldn't access credit, they were really struggling. So this current survey that we're doing now, and we've, we've just done it and we've analysed the results, and this was, this was the workshop today, is about, well, what types of credit are most important. Um, what, is, uh, the other, what are the other types of financial inclusion? And we're really finding that um, this, this, this uh, sector in Pakistan is moving very quickly, but there's a real need to have the evidence about what's working, um, what isn't working, and also particularly about what's working for women and you know, what are the conditions that will assist women to become uh, I guess more important uh, and financial, financially um, empowered in, in these uh, rural communities. Um, so, so given the, the fact that, that there's such extensive research work done, uh, you mentioned that the access to credit is, is difficult uh, for the small farmers. So, uh, how do you see, what's the difficulty, you know, why are they particularly struggling out here though? Is it, is it because the banks aren't available or the, the community banks aren't present? Or what are the problems that, that small farmers are facing though? Yeah, that's, a, that's a really great question. I mean, it's, it's a range of factors and um, one of those factors is that, um, you know, often the, the smaller providers that, that can help the farmers are, are not available. Uh, financial literacy actually understanding what's being offered to them and the terms, you talked about that today, um, is, is, a, is a big impediment as well. Um, but, but there are other things that are quite cultural as well. So we have quite good evidence that um, for, for faith, reasons of faith, a, a lot of farmers are reluctant to take loans based on interest uh, because you know, it, it is not compliant with the Quran. So, so what we're seeing is the need to develop solutions that will assist farmers, but they need to be Pakistani solutions that fit the local context. Um, Your Excellency Adamson, I'd like to find out, uh, um, at a government level, uh, how easy has it been to work with the banks to, to provide the credit, or, or how difficult has it been? I mean, 
is the response welcoming from the small farmers or as, as Professor John said, are they sort of a hands-off approach? How, how does it work at a government level? Government level within Pakistan, I, I would defer here to my, uh, my colleague, the, the Pakistani High Commissioner to Australia because she would be more familiar uh, with uh, the, the government sector in, in, uh, in its uh, own interactions with the, the financial services sector. What I have observed, however, is just as um, uh, uh, Professor Steen has been saying, um, is, is that there is clearly uh, a, a strong need for access to finance uh, for uh, the um, equitable and sustainable and successful um, transformation of the agricultural sector in, in Pakistan. I mean, our two countries have been working together in the agricultural sector, both in terms of support through the Australian aid program, but also through collaborative research. Uh, and also on a commercial level, actually, as we speak about the, uh, the vibrant relationship between and broadly based relationship between our two countries. But when it comes to the agricultural sector and also the water sector and all the issues to do with a successful uh, agricultural sector, so we've been working together since the 1980s. So it's a very broadly based uh, collaborative um, partnership that we have developed with Pakistan. And as you said in your own um, introductory remarks, uh, the reason for that uh, again is manifold, but um, key reasons for it are both of our countries rely enormously on agriculture for our economies. It's an absolutely fundamental uh, element or core part of our economies. And as well, both of our countries have very um, powerful devolution out to provinces or states. And both of our countries uh, also have issues to do with availability of water. But when it comes to Pakistan, there's an additional layer of, of urgency, if you like, and that is that Pakistan is, is very vulnerable to climate change impacts, as is Australia. But Pakistan's workforce is the much more engaged in the agricultural sector than is the case in Australia. And so there are huge social issues that are uh, also encapsulated in a successful uh, agricultural economy for Pakistan. And then, of course, you come very quickly to the issue uh, of access to finance and indeed access to finance for women and, and the importance of engaging women in Pakistan's economy. So perhaps I'll stop there only to say that it, it's very, very clear uh, to me as a layperson and at today's seminar, I was very pleased to engage with uh, many, many uh, representatives from the financial services sector, some in the formal sector in terms of the traditional banks, some in the what is becoming, I think, a very vibrant sector here in Pakistan, which is the, the microfinance sector. And in that sector, you are also seeing a proliferation of different, uh, shall we say, different products. And some of those are being offered also by companies whose core business is not necessarily financial services, but that they are seeing the big need and they are coming forward to help um, their, potentially their client base, to have access to credit. Bringing them out of the informal sector into something of a more sustainable and fairer um, financial availability uh, opportunity. That too, very, very important. And another aspect of all of this too is of course insurance. Um, insurance against, again, the vagaries of climate or natural disaster, but also against um, you know, fluctuations in, in, in price, etc. So on many, many levels, my sense is that there is important momentum here in Pakistan, and uh, this is a very, very important area um, of the, uh, the future for Pakistan's successful uh, agricultural economy. Uh, but just to uh, understand specifically, I mean, how exactly is the Australian government helping uh, uh, women farmers in, in, in terms of uh, microfinance, in terms of credit availability? Uh, is, is it just solely research-based work or is it more like on the ground practical uh, application? How exactly is the government supporting uh, women farmers or credit availability in Pakistan exactly? Uh, to add to my own remarks, but as I said before, we've, we've been engaged uh, in these sectors with Pakistan since the 1980s. Um, and, and so, you know, we have capacity building and we often say in Australia at the farm gate. So that means right out, you know, into the farming communities, onto the actual farms. Uh, we conduct uh, capacity building courses for farmers, small, hold fa small holder farmers 
in various uh, aspects of agriculture. And I should quickly say, when we talk about agriculture, we also mean livestock and dairy. So these incredibly important sectors, um, as we hear the statistics mm. so often about how important uh, the dairy sector uh, and, and the livestock sector is, uh, is to Pakistani agricultural families. Um, and so in that, in that uh, set of areas, we have had a lot of extension service support. We worked for 10 years just in the mango sector, actually, just with a single product, you know, uh, looking at the, um, the best um, uh, prospect mango varieties for export, looking at the pruning techniques, looking at the, you know, the, the best uh, soil and, and mango variety match. Um, so uh, as I said, 10 years of extension and research and capacity building and training work along a value chain. And the value chain, of course, starts with, I guess, you know, research or the farm gate, whichever one you want to say starts uh, first. Um, but it involves also scholarships for numbers of Pakistanis uh, who have gone to study in Australia as part of this long, uh, long tailed project. An extension, fundamentally a value chain extension mm -hmm. services and research and capacity building and scholarship attached project over one full decade. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of become a bit of a model uh, for you know, our uh, philosophical approach, very much meeting the demands that we hear from, from Pakistan. When it comes to women, we have focused again through our aid program, through all of our investments. Obviously we have investments beyond agriculture as well when it comes to the aid program as a whole. But we have that gender lens um, again coming through to the need to engage women and this is a global consideration uh, to engage women more in our you know, collective uh, economies and that comes also down to Pakistan and of course here so many women who are working in Pakistan are working in the agricultural sector. So scholarships, capacity building, um, responding to what we are hearing from the farming community, what we are hearing uh, from our research, what we are hearing from the universities, what we are hearing from government at the federal and, uh, and provincial levels in terms of what they want Australia to provide. Again, we won't provide everything that Pakistan needs or wants. It just so happens that we have a lot of experience for the reasons I mentioned before, which seem to fit particularly well with Pakistan's own needs and, and circumstances. Our climatic um, circumstances are also quite similar. I mean, Australia being a continent, we have a tropical part. We also have a desert part and, and a temperate part. And as I said before, those other very severe water management issues, uh, which are also so incredibly important to manage if you're going to have successful uh, future for, for your agriculture. And when it comes to finance, uh, there too, in, in one of our um, products uh, under the aid program, <clears throat> we are um, also working with um, some of the microfinance providers uh, in, uh, in, in uh, collecting data, but also in terms of using them as partners to ensure that women are getting, um, as it were, a good share of access to the available uh, financial products that these organisations are offering. We'll continue our conversation after the short break. Welcome back. I will, I'll definitely be getting into the water management because that's obviously a severe crisis that Pakistan's been facing uh, for the last couple of years, maybe even decades by now. Um, and I do believe that your that there's a recent program that was also launched. Uh, I think last year it was uh, it was a 12 million dollar fund initiative, I believe. Uh, but we'll get to that. I wanted to move to you, uh, your uh, Ambassador John, and. And there's a lot of work that the Australian High Commission, Commission is doing here in Pakistan, as we've been discussing, though. Um, how is your ambassadorship and, and your office in Canberra able to complement and supplement the kind of work uh, that uh, Ambassador Adamson and, and even the research work that's been uh, undertaken? How are you able to complement or support, help propel the, the, the programs uh, from the other side? Well, we are doing a lot of work. And let's start from Her Excellency has spoken of 1980s. That's when the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research got into it. 
Our agricultural relationship dates back since the establishment of relationship, which was in 1948. But, uh, and I often joke with my Australian friends that the Queensland mango actually came from Pakistan. <laughs> and the Sahiwal uh, bull that was taken to Australia and they did experimentation and improved it to a level that now we are taking Sahiwal from Australia rather than from Sahiwal. So <laughs> these are the developments and partnerships. But uh, we are doing a lot of work and obviously uh, Her Excellency and myself, we work as one team. Uh, I project Pakistan's views there and uh, I have found Australia a good friend positively inclined towards Pakistan and uh, in my speech also I said that you know the RCR program actually comes under their foreign affairs so Foreign Minister Julie Bishop herself is taking personal interest in it and when I interact with her she told me that we believe in partnership and we are learning from each other's best practices and uh, the RCR projects are basically need-based so it is not Australia imposing its views on us. We interact and the experts here, Dr. Johnstein, Dr. Shabir um, and Dr. Ijaz Qureshi and all these people there working and of course Andrew Campbell who is the CEO of the RCR. Um, I interact with them constantly and I interact with my government which is very interested in agricultural uh, development and you know, it is our main mainstay of our economy. So we are doing a lot of work and a lot of projects are amended and adapted according to the need. And uh, Her Excellency spoke of gender. Uh, the government of Pakistan is also very focused on gender. And you know, our poverty alleviation program is uh, being implemented. Our commitment to the sustainable development goals is also uh, manifested by what the policies the government is implementing uh, and when we have good partnership it is you know a win-win situation for both sides uh, and uh, I'm privileged to represent my country in Australia where even recently we had joint trade committee meeting and agriculture was also an agenda item there and when Her Excellency spoke of mangoes uh, Aust with, uh, with Australian assistance, we have established the vapor heat and water, uh, hot water plants. For Why is that exactly? Could you uh, elaborate? These are on treatment that? plants for mangoes because you see Australia has very strict quarantine rules. And earlier on, we could not export our agricultural products to Australia because of the stringent quarantine laws there. And I have been negotiating with Australian side and of course Her Excellency is here. And it is clear that these are not uh, kind of discrimination against Pakistan, although I did hear a few times that, you know, why is Australia making it so difficult for our products to reach them? But I tell them, even within Australia, from one state to another to take a product <laughs> is impossible. So it's if you're... Exactly, exactly. So if you're flying from Canberra to Sydney uh, in the plane, they say, okay, if you're eating a banana, leave it in the plane. <laughs> Don't take it with you because the quarantine laws in New South Wales are different from the capital territory. So it is as strong as that. But because of that uh, very strong goodwill between our two countries, Australia helped us in establishing these plants which not only have facilitated our export of mangoes to Australia, but also to international market because these are international requirements. So it has given us international market access. Mm -hmm. So we thank the government of Australia for its support. But uh, it was very important because they were talking about micro credit financing and you know that government of Pakistan has been uh, looking at it very seriously. And these projects are being implemented. But because of the partnership, Australia wants to play its role where it is important for Pakistan. And microcredit financing, therefore, became an important topic. And this was basically a scoping exercise. And then I'm confident that we move forward on this.
You mentioned that there, there are multiple avenues to uh, the agricultural sector. I mean, usually we just see it in black and white as crops, but obviously, as you mentioned, there's livestock, there's dairy farming, there's uh, microfinancing. So, Professor John, has your research led you to other areas of improvement in Pakistan's agricultural sector that can be undertaken that uh, is not there? I mean, with technology nowadays, it, it, it's vastly... Uh, improving our lives in all sectors, uh, but I, I personally feel that there's a lot more space and improvement uh, for Pakistan's agriculture uh, sector, which might be lagging, say, a couple of years behind where the rest of the world is. Or so, is there are there other areas that that your department or your university is looking at, or is it more specifically on microfinancing at this point? No, because one one thing that um, small businesses in it, almost every sector around the world are facing at the moment is adapting to change, you know, whether that's climate change or economic change. And uh, Pakistan is a country that's changing very quickly. So how do these small agricultural you know, family businesses adapt to all of these changes that are going on? You know, changing in, 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 in market demand, um, changing in the regulations, cha changing in the climate. And one thing that we're looking at is um, this idea about resilience. You know, how, how do these businesses um, adapt to these these changes that are going on and there are a number of things that are really important uh, and we see this wherever we look um, if we look at businesses adapting in, in rural Queensland or businesses adapting in Vietnam resilience is important and, and one important part of resilience is um, having the finances the financial um, if you like flexibility to adapt through change so this is where where, where um, the you know finance and credit comes in Insurance is also a big part of that. But another part of it is being able to understand and take on board what's happening in your environment um, and then being able to think about well, what do I need to be doing or who do I need to work with now. So this really becomes uh, an issue of capacity and we talked a lot about capacity in the workshop today. So in addition to um, having the having you know finance, there also needs to be a level of capacity building, which is about raising education standards um, to enable farmers to take you know make make high value opportunities, um, and also to to allow farmers to work together with each other to take advantage of larger markets or take on bigger loans. So this collaboration aspect. We also talked about. Um, the importance of uh, cooperatives and how cooperatives might help the sector as well. So this, you know, what I think what we really want to get to is a point where we can talk about a resilient Pakistani agricultural sector that can adapt to changes. And that's going to become incredibly important because, uh, as the High Commissioner alluded to, um, you know, climate change is coming quickly and it's going to have enormous implications for the Pakistani agricultural sector, as indeed it will Australia. We'll continue our conversation after the short break. Issues I feel that Pakistan's been facing is is the water levels, uh, even either below the surface or even that the rainwater in the monsoon season that Pakistan receives. Um, you'll see as, as normal climate change go, you'll see vast days of uh, flood level rains, and then you'll go months without water at all. Though, um, as I mentioned earlier, that Australia's recent last year had a, a million dollar, multi million dollar initiative uh, on the Water Sustainable Program. Uh, could you elaborate on that program exactly? Like, what's the program? What's the policy objectives, goals? Uh, how exactly is Australia facilitating and helping? Uh, Pakistan manage their water. The um, the agriculture the, um, is one thing the that of course we've been focusing on, and just you know clearly you cannot have successful agriculture if you don't have sufficient water. Mm -hmm. And in the country like or the continent like Australia, where we are um, water stressed, um, and yet uh, we we have this very very important agricultural sector. So what we have learned. Um, over many, many painful years, I assure you, as we were alluding to the differences between our states and devolution and argumentation, etc., um, is that one really does need to focus on efficiency, sustainability, uh, equitable access and appropriate um, use of water, not only, of course, for agriculture, I mean, town water, the environment, industry, 
all have legitimate needs uh, for sufficient water supply. And so it's the efficient um, harnessing, uh, efficient disposition, uh, efficient transport um, of that water. And for many, many years, Australia has been engaged uh, again in a, in a research partnership um, with, uh, with Pakistan um, and responding to, to Pakistan's own um, desire for this research to go forward in terms of the, the Indus Valley. And there, of course, very quickly you get to the region. And we, we rely in Australia in the southeast and we're our, if you like, the, the, the main focus of our population, our industry um, and also our agriculture tends to be concentrated through this one single river system. So similarly, Pakistan has a single river system upon which it overwhelmingly relies. I mean, I'm conscious, of course, in Australia, just like Pakistan, there is uh, an important uh, uh, secondary set of water supply. And one of those, which again is a very big policy area and, and challenge for both of our countries is the sustainable uh, exploitation of groundwater and how groundwater relates also to those major river systems. You've yourself um, uh, also alluded to the fluctuations that climate change is, is bringing upon us. Uh, in Australia, it's normally, rather than flooding, though sometimes we do have that, but normally in Australia, it's a drought situation. And that has really driven this, I would say, community consciousness of the need to be very um, uh, prudent and, and uh, very uh, uh, very mean, as it were, actually, uh, even to the point of observing each other, how much water is in, is in use uh, you know, mm. on your garden. We have limited hours in the summertime that you can water your garden, the sorts of watering devices you can use, whether e even you can wash your car. You know, it comes down to you know, really those kinds of levels. And so I think that that experience resonates in Pakistan where um, although um, I think the, the, the um, uh, levels of water security consciousness have not really reached mm. that level because you haven't been confronted by the length of drought mm. and, the, and the sense of, oh my goodness, we really are on the edge of a catastrophe here, mm. which we have reached in Australia Indeed, at yeah. one point. And that yeah. really drove um, this interstate um, harmony or consensus, I suppose, mm. uh, would be the way to put it, to create a um, interstate, not just intra, but interstate approach to water management of you know this existential lifeline we have, and hence that example, that um, that experience, as as I said, resonated in Pakistan and, and uh, the Australian mm. expertise um, to create the data sets but also to provide some, um, some brainstorm support um, in the policy uh, arena as well. Quite obviously, every country will find their own, you know, their, their own approach which suits their circumstances, but sometimes it can be helpful to draw on you know, the, the experience, and as I said before, some sort of quite painful experience, yeah. uh, you know, littered with mistakes mm. that, that we have made in our own, and, and to actually take advantage um, of, um, of, of the outcomes and, and find some way through. So this is where we have been working with Pakistan uh, on, the, on the Indus Basin uh, uh, availability of water, but also through that regional program, also looking at the situation of, of glacier melt. Mm. That's another very important uh, aspect of, of the collective research that's being done across the region. So the, um, the investment that you alluded to under the Australian Water Partnership in Pakistan, which is what we now term our partnership, it comes under that, um, that, uh, that umbrella. We have dedicated over a number of years, um, 12 million Australian dollars to this sustainable development uh, investment portfolio program, which, which covers water and energy uh, and also food. So nutrition is, is very much part of, of uh, that mix. We'll continue our conversation after the short break. You mentioned a lot about uh, policy and even in today's seminar I, I constantly heard policy and homegrown policy and organic policy. 
Uh, Your Excellency John, I wanted to know that recently you were uh, nominated as a policy advisory council at the Australian Centre for uh, Agricultural Research. So, uh, could you sort of elaborate what exactly is the work of the council and the kind of policy advisory role that you're able to play over there uh, that obviously would sort of uh, help and further Pakistan's uh, agriculture uh, prospects? And uh, we must bear in mind that although you look at it, uh, look at Australia as one big country, but it's actually a continent, and we call our provinces provinces, they call them states, because each state has its own constitution and its own system of management. Mm. And their negotiations, because Mare Darling River starts from north, from Queensland, where mm. John Steen comes from, and it goes down to South Australia, and different states have been, you know, negotiating on the mm. flow of water, and then, as Her Excellency spoke of uh, the scarcity of water, all these issues they have worked very hard on, and we have to learn from the best practices. And uh, we would be a water scarce country in not very long time ahead. So. It is a good preparation for us that we have good friends who can support us in that. But talking about Policy Advisory Council, I have the privilege of being the only High Commissioner who is part of PAC, and that's because I've been indulging in it. And uh, it's a very good platform because that basically interacts with the Foreign Minister. Mm -hmm. And mm, as I said, Australia is not uh, a country that wants to dictate its position on us. They want to take our inputs. So in the PAC, I would give recommendations on the projects that Australia is doing, like Her Excellency spoke of the water management. So when you talk about water management, our traditional you know, practice is just flood the fields with water and you know everybody's fighting this is my share of water so this has to come to me irrespective of what of crop water, I yeah. have and how much water mm -hmm. I need. Mm -hmm. But Australia has learned to use minimum water with maximum productivity. Mm -hmm. And this, that's an experiment we need to apply but with us because of the traditional practices and the system of policies that we have had where we had quota for each, you know, user or consumer, and then that consumer wanted to take all the water that he was given, irrespective of his need. Mm -hmm. But now the government of Pakistan is in the process of formulating water policy, and in that we need friends who have advanced themselves mm -hmm. to a level where they have managed. Of course, they have challenges. It's not that Australia is not having challenges, mm, of course. but at least they have worked on it. Mm. And we are also working on it, but if we learn from each other, then it helps us leapfrog mm. rather than going through the same mm. Exactly. Thing. So in the PAC, I would give advice to the Australian government on the implementation of projects they have in Pakistan. I could ask them on the ground, how are those projects working? Of course. What are the challenges they are finding? So that when I go back, I would tell them, listen, your, this project has these problems when it comes to local communities. Mm. And they would then adapt it accordingly. So it is friends working together to support each other to have that progress because now we are part of this one planet mm -hmm. and the sustainable development goals basically further highlight the importance of the developed and the developing countries to work together to make this planet a better place. Mm -hmm. We have spoken of the climate change. We are, although I always say that we have a very small carbon footprint, mm -hmm. yet we are the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. one of the most vulnerable countries mm -hmm. when it comes Indeed. to climate mm -hmm. change. Indeed. So we need to work on it, mm. and uh, in COP23 also, we have mm. been active, uh, but we need friends to work with. I'm doing that job, and I have that privilege. Thank you so much. Um, what we, it's, uh, we could have taken this conversation further though, but we're running out of time here. But I want to thank all of you for A, making the time out for us, and B, for doing the fantastic work that will 
uh, literally hit every Pakistani because Pakistan is an agro-based economy though and um, the more help that Pakistan can get for its sustainable growth uh, and, and for, for food security which inevitably leads to national security um, it, it, and it, it's, it's great the kind of collaboration work that's being done, the kind of research work that's been done and the kind of representation that we have for Pakistan in Australia though. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to shift the topic to one last particular question though. Congratulations to Australia for winning the Ashes, <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, they, 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 they're up 3-0, fourth one was a draw, I think the fifth is a dead rubber now though. But um, the, the question I'd like to ask is like, we can only test Australia's uh, test might once and prowess once they come to Pakistan though. And uh, once they do play uh, the Pakistani Tigers on home soil. Uh, even though we've been playing in Dubai for the last 10 years for obvious reasons. Uh, when can we expect, fingers crossed, uh, to see some Australian cricket uh, being played at, say, Kazafi Stadium for that matter, though? Well, we are working on it. And I met Cricket Australia before coming. And uh, they are looking at it. And uh, let's see when it happens. But I'm pursuing it actively. and. Her Excellency is also supporting that. So. Great news to you, and fingers crossed we get to see them. Uh, there are a lot soon. of Australians who would love to see a, a, a strong Pakistan they against of the epic battles with the like Yunus <laughs> and Waz and Akram. We can get Great our players. Players. <laughs> spin bowlers up <laughs> against some Australian <laughs> test batsmen, though. But uh, thank you so much for the interview, and thank you so much for taking the time out today. It was a great conversation with you today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.